Hello, everybody. Good morning. And I have a already a screw up. Hold on a second. We need to add. There he is, Ivan. And we need to take this off. Check, All check, right. check. We're back. All right. We, we have. It's Monday morning. The topic today is how to slay the week. Inspiration for that came from, of course, Ivan. We'll go through some of those tips at the end, but there's so much to talk about, about crypto, about Bitcoin, about FUD. Uh, and I think one of the things that upsets me the most, um, well, f I always forgot. First of all, everybody, subscribe to these two gentlemen. Links are below. But I want to talk about what annoys me the most is when mainstream media, when, uh, what, what do you call the bears, Ivan? <laughs> the people with the bearer syndrome. The bear flancers. The bear, bear flancers. <laughs> that kills me every time. Um, when they keep people out of a life-changing opportunity, I get really upset. And uh, we're just going to jump right in. we got a big agenda. we got to talk about governments, media, crypto, layer twos, Bitcoin, ETH, ETH premine, um, what's happening with disruption in crypto and so much more. Also, some of the EU regulations. We, this is just so much to talk about. Thank you again both for coming. But let's talk about this first. All right, this is FUD. Um, and I, I, there's no point in me blowing it up, but it, it's from Nate Garacci. Basically, Financial Times comes out and says, the inflows to the Bitcoin funds have dried up. All right. And then Bloomberg FUD. I made a quick five-minute video on this last night because it just was crazy. Options traders suggest that they're bracing for an extended decline in Bitcoin. Bitcoin was at 64,000 at the time. Now it's at 69,000. This is just in hours, okay? And then <laughs> Elon Musk, friend of the channel. <laughs> Breaking news, the Wall Street Journal is dying. If you look at website organic traffic, it is down from 33, 34 million down to 10 million in a very short window of time, ladies and gentlemen, like we're talking two years. And as I forecast, I said, you know, the place where people are going for real-time news is X. Anything this guy Elon touches turns to gold, despite everybody hating him in the world because he has so much power. I'd like to ask you both, um, starting with you, Ivan, I see you nodding first. What do you think about mainstream media FUD and the changes and disruption coming to traditional newspapers and traditional media outlets? Yeah, I mean, it does definitely happening. But what's important is to not watch the news, not listen to what people say, but um, uh, see what they do. And I know that you, CTO, have been discussing it as well on your channel because the chart tells us what people are doing. That's why normally if the uh, Bitcoin trend is bullish, if Tether is printing, there is no need to worry. I mean, literally no need to worry. And you just follow the strategy. Then you see all these news articles, clickbait. You see the traffic going down so much for Wall Street Journal. Obviously, they want some clickbait. They want to drive some traffic. They may be testing some FUD. Maybe if we FUD, Bitcoin is going to give more more traffic you're gonna think the way they try to drive their kpis and also they don't really trade i mean they themselves are not a factor in the market the chart tells us what is a factor in the market and um, this fad is definitely not affecting at all that's why for most people it's better to look at the chart than to see news because most news is fake news yes i mean sometimes you have real news let's say an asteroid hits earth and we have a massive nu nuclear catastrophe. Obviously, that's going to affect the market. But that news, I mean, never happens. It's rarely, rarely that real news is actually affecting the market. Most headlines you see is Fugazi. That's why you look at the chart. And if the chart is uh, in a bullish trend, uh, you're bullish. It's very simple. CTO, what do you think about all of this as you've been talking I about think, it? Too? I think like Ivan says that they're working on clicks, right? That they're not there to provide the value to people. They need clicks for the ads. So if something is pumping, it's up. They're going to say it's going to pump higher. To, you know, and when it's down, they're like the worst people on, I don't know, influencers or something. When it's down, people want to hear it's going to go down further. So they will say it's going to go down further. The pump is over and so on and so forth. I think it's... It, it's just like that. It's garbage. There's no value in it. No need to listen to it, I think. And I mean, the whole, like the bigger shift that's happening, I had that as one of my seven points in this era digitalis. We don't need the media anymore. It's peer-to-peer -peer media now. We listen to, you know, what's happening with Tesla or something. We follow Elon Musk. We can see it, you know, real time. We don't need someone to put it on the website yes. we can see it straight i mean 
traditional media has been come like screenshots of X, basically. Okay. <laughs> a, a, and a, a day later as well, which is really funny. Yeah, the, exactly. other, the other good thing about Elon is he tells the truth. He does not lie. And one of my mm. dreams for 2024 is to have truth in the world. Truth from governments, truth from politicians, truth from media, etc. Anyway, let's look at the ETF so far. You know, every, it's, it's as if the narrative is coordinated across the media because papers all over the world are saying the same thing. Oh, the ETF is a failure. It's like, everybody here, this is the script for the week. Tell everybody. But look, these nine new ETFs took in 475,000 Bitcoin in 50 trading days. Okay. Um, can you put in perspective for us, CTO Larson, how many is half a million Bitcoin compared to the overall supply? And for that to be sucked into new funds in just 50 days, how big that is? Yeah, I mean, it's it's enormous. Uh, yeah. It is enormous. I mean, this is what's been driving the market. And actually, I didn't know one key thing until last week. Much of the GBTC outflows, apparently, it's like uh, Genesis and uh, you know, connected to that bankruptcy, FTX. and they're actually yeah. buying back spot Bitcoin. So a lot of that outflow actually isn't outflow. I didn't know that. So no, actually, the outflow is not going back into Bitcoin. These were speculators with the cash and carry trade for Grayscale. They're not swapping from GBTC into IBIT or something. They're just getting out and investing in other things. And that's that's the big narrative that people are missing. Maybe 40% of it is leaving GBTC and going into new spot ETFs, but most of it is going to other investments entirely, which is really stunning. We also have some other really good outlook. And I know, CTO, you know Asia. So I did this analysis yesterday. I was just playing with numbers. And I cal calculated the number of billionaires per country. And uh, some interesting stats fell out of this. But we have China and Hong Kong coming because I'm trying to figure out how much money, you know, there's 22 ETFs launching in Hong Kong next month in April, okay, in 30 days. The halving is happening in 25 days. And we have nearly 550 billionaires, just billionaires only. I'm not even counting the millionaires in Hong Kong and China. What are they going to be looking to do with their money considering the real estate market is in the toilet in China? Ivan, any thoughts on this one? Well, I mean, it's, it's obvious when you are in China, you better try to get your money out somehow. So you go to Hong Kong, it's a bit more connected to, to the Western world. And then, you know, the world is your oyster. Bitcoin is obviously the best because it's not connected to any other government. And um, that's what people now, are, I think, are realizing that this is an investment which really transcends nation states. And uh, if you want to have something long term that you can leave to your kids that will not be dependent on whims of some uh, political party or some kind of political political decision, it is it is Bitcoin, it is crypto. So for me, it's a no brainer. If there's I mean, think about for yourself also, guys, in the chat, if you had to pick one asset that you hold where you cannot touch it for, let's say, 50 years, what would you do? Would you pick some real estate? Would you pick some stock or would you pick uh, crypto? Crypto is the only solution. Exactly. Um, CTO, I know you spent a lot of time in Asia. What do you think of the statistic? There is one billionaire for every 113,000 people in Hong Kong. <laughs> That's the richest place yeah, on absolutely. the planet. I mean, the first time I was in Hong Kong, I couldn't understand it. Like they were telling the property prices and it looked like it's some back street or something. And I realized, but these apartments here, they cost 10 times as much as the apartments in Stockholm where I lived at the time. And I realized that, oh, wow, we, we have no idea in the West how big, how much money it is. Uh, yeah, it is enormous because, of course, on social media, you don't see much about Asia. It's all US dominated. And um, yeah, but but there's a lot of rich people there, guys. OK, let's talk and about Bitcoin. Have an enormous impact. And, exactly. And so, say, so the money, like, like when the point is, everybody, Bitcoin's not going to crash. Bitcoin's not going down. Bitcoin's not going to 30,000 or 40,000 that everybody keeps saying. The bear fluencers, as Ivan says, look at the money that's coming in. That's all you need to know. This is a money flow game. This is now a bona fide asset class, and it's never been that before. All right, before we switch gears, CTO, do you want to tell us about Bitcoin and the chart right now? What's going on? Because it just yep. pumped just when we started the show. It's quite unbelievable. Absolutely. Always pumps before DCA. So if you could share that screen, I will 
happily Whoop. talk about that. Uh, guess to share. Whoops. I have to. Um, <laughs> I've got to find where it is. I allocated you. Oh, hold on a second. Um, it's it's locked me down. Um, let me try this. And let me try this. Uh, I had I had somebody architect my system, so I can't <laughs> screw up. And now it's locked down, and I can't even unlock it. <laughs> Let's come back to that afterwards. I'm sorry about that, guys. I'm actually somehow sharing my screen, which is weird. Um, anyway, let me... I can try hack it. But the problem is things are unlocked. Da, 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 bear with me, everybody. Live TV. Um, exactly. That's how I, it is. Yeah, Entertaining. Fidgeting with AI, guys. Real. We're not, uh, you know, pre-recording. Yeah. It's not <laughs> AI. It's real. And but it's been a funny thing, actually. We always joke about it. Like a few hours before the DCA, Bitcoin has pumped. Is it like four out of five times? I'm not sure if it is, you know, could it be that it's the Monday morning for some reason, the, uh, you know, ETF interest picks up or something in the US. I'm not sure why it is, but it's been an interesting fact. And it's pumped a lot. Yeah. Um, I don't. I can't. I can't get your screen to share. It's completely locked down. I'm sorry, but anyway, the the market is I going can, crazy. I can comment on it then. Yeah. Uh, while if we can solve it, it's probably easier to understand. But we we actually had a head and shoulders pattern that confirmed six days ago on the Tuesday, Tuesday nineteenth March, and that okay. is a uh, you know that's a pattern where we expect uh, a downside. So. I was very happy and very excited because the trend is up. The trend is no doubt up, no matter what uh, you know measure you have. I use Larson line, but it doesn't matter. Like whatever, whatever measure of trend you use, it's going to be up. And the dip then is very exciting because there's finally times then maybe to add more entries. If you have like, you know, earned more money or something, you're excited to put more money in. So I was actually very excited. And I bet on a 20% decline from the top because that's what we usually have gotten. And you missed but by 2%, I think. We only got 18%. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you can't win every time. I was waiting for 20%. We didn't get it. We got 18 So, you know, sadly, I didn't get any new entries. But of course, I have the entries from before. But uh, yeah, so I'm, we're not sitting here and trying to, I'm not trying to paint some idealized picture. I didn't get 20%. I hoped we would get to 58. We got only to 60. Hmm. And, but the interesting part of that is that there's something called head and shoulders invalidation also. That is when price crosses the high of the right shoulder. So now you have to imagine it. It's like head and shoulder. And... Uh, then if price crosses the right shoulder, then that's a very strong bullish signal. And it just did now, like uh, half an hour ago, 30 minutes ago, just before the show. So yeah. now trend is up, chart pattern, insanely bullish. And the thing that I mentioned before, I read that from Eric Balchuna, so he's one of the people worth listening to when it comes to the ETFs. He wrote that the GBTC outflows is largely genesis. We know this for a fact, who is simply exchanging GBTC for spot BTC. Ah, here we have the, here we have the chart. Got you. Sorry. Live TV. Excellent. <laughs> then let me switch to that instead. So if we, switch this this to closing prices you can see it clearer here was left shoulder head right shoulder so here on tuesday this broke down and then now we switch back to the candles we can see the prices the target here was about 58k we didn't get it we got 60,800, i think and then we reversed and here you see now, here was the right shoulder. We have crossed that price now. So now we have invalidated this head and shoulder. It did dump, but not 
as not it almost dumped to the target but not exactly and now it has reversed and crossed the right shoulder which is a very bullish pattern so price looks fantastic trend is up bullish chart pattern and it looks great so where Biden do we go where do we go next where, where, where do we go next the mainstream media yeah. and uh, yeah i i expect a continuation from here then but uh, any any price targets in the next 25 days will we obviously we're going to smash 75k uh by a lot of people saying 100k by the having technically if history repeats that's definitely possible because after bitcoin breaks an all-time high it typically you know adds a huge amount within 18 days on average where do you see us going um i mean the, the technical target from if we zoom out a little bit we had this channel and then that channel broke out here then the target is uh channel of the channel high of the same height and that would be K. about here at 89 90 yeah. k so so that is the technical chart target but then when will we reach there that that uh impossible to say yeah and i think everything i just can i share this tab also because i really wanted to have uh, your opinion about it yes uh, this was the comment that i mentioned here now you yep. can't see the highlight i think oh yeah yeah there it is so the bitcoin etf this part here that genesis is exchanging gbtc for spot uh btc which is then a net neutral event. I don't know if this is true. I haven't checked it, but I thought that was an interesting thing that I hadn't seen before because I had tracked a lot of that GPC outflow. But if yeah. that is actually no, buying um, back on the other side. No, so it's, it's basically DCG is the company that owns Genesis. Genesis is bankrupt. They owe a ton of money. They're in bankruptcy court and they had to liquidate their GBTC shares. They had $1.4 billion worth of GBTC that they had to flush. I thought two yeah. weeks ago they had finished that, but no, they had another half a billion, uh, 750 million to go. And that's what happened last week. There was the three big flush days from Grayscale. So Eric Balchun is normally pretty good, but I they did not swap it out. This is not what happened, at least from the data that I see, but I could be wrong. And it's all to do with the DCG bankruptcy. But anyway, let's talk about um, let me try to get this thing back. I wonder, can we get back to ourselves? Uh, yes, unbelievable. Let's talk about ETH. Everybody is freaking out about ETH and saying, what's going on? Um, and you guys know the history of the ETH pre-mine. Now it's bubbling up because apparently the US government is not going to approve the ETH ETF, which everybody had as hopium, that it would pump their bags, etc. But uh, one of the reasons for this not being approved is because of the ETH pre-mine. We're going back in history here. And uh, Hey Apollo wrote this beautiful little piece, a little chart on the right, exactly what the merge is, but had to explain Ethereum to new Bitcoiners. Imagine if Satoshi pre-mined 14 million Bitcoin and gave it to his private investors. And then he removed the 21 million cap, and then he removed proof of work. And instead, the new Bitcoin is paid as interest to existing holders. That doesn't sit right with the SEC and many other people. Well, I'm interested, Ivan, what do you think of this ETH pre-mine? Is it a big Ponzi slash scam or is it legitimate? Uh, I mean, Coinbase is ready to sue SEC as we speak. Yes. And SEC lost to Ripple. <laughs> and uh, I think they're going to lose this uh, ETH uh, as well. I think ETH ETF is uh not inevitable maybe but i think it's very high likelihood because obviously blackrock wants that uh, passive income and if i mean if you compare it to other altcoins if is the most credible it is on um, C cme futures and uh, all of that so likely they are looking at uh, eth next also blackrock has a fun now on eth and now it's a question of this uh, yeah will sec approve i mean i think that argument does make sense uh, in one way that they did have this pre-sale it was in 2014 but in Bitcoin, you had people mining early. So uh, whoever learned about Bitcoin early on could also get an advantage. Now, is it the same? It's not exactly the same, but you know, whoever found it first, whoever. And I know many people that were also in ETH 
uh, ICO. So it was quite open. It was back in the day where like the average Joe could actually invest in ICOs. Now it's impossible. Now it's more private sales. So I think it's going to be very interesting. It's, I think it, Coinbase is the ones that are going to drive this uh, case. And they it's obviously in their interest that it is approved uh, because they're going to have basically double their ETF business because now there's <laughs> Bitcoin, and there's ETH. Yeah. And BlackRock, I think, also loves uh, this passive income um, uh, aspect of ETH. And also ETH is deflationary based on the transaction burn uh, in each fee. Mm. Uh, in each transaction, a bit of the fee is burned. So it is going down in supply. But yes, theoretically, there is no cap. But practically, it is going down in supply because of this uh, fee burn. So yeah, I mean, very interesting to see <laughs> to see overall how the SEC is going to fare. But because they lost against Ripple, man, I cannot imagine how they're going to take on this uh, ETH uh, battle. Even with this, uh, I know, I mean, this is what Bitcoiners often bring up, this uh, that it was pre-mined, this and that. Uh, um, not sure if that matters a lot. Probably it matters to some extent. Um, so yeah, it's but it's like a weighing. You gotta weigh everything together. So weighing everything together, I do think they're gonna they're gonna approve it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I, CTO. I thought about. I actually made a video just last week because I thought about one thing in the debate. Now we see a lot of it's like Gary Gensler and he only likes Bitcoin. He doesn't like anything else. But I think for many other politicians, I think it's the other way around. I think it's an easier pill to swallow something like ethereum which is like oh it's that's programmers they're running some code on a network and it's a distributed ledger you can use it for logistics and all kinds of aspects that's quite easy to swallow that pill as opposed to bitcoin which is like okay we're going to take over the function of the central banks and we programmers have done the money now and we don't need you you know central bank managers and politicians and everyone can go home we got it from here that's a very difficult message to swallow plus it's using electricity so uh, i think for many other politicians they would be more okay to approve some of these lay one uh, coins actually as an as an ETF but I'm sure also it will be a political decision so I don't know how it will go in this uh, uh, government but if it changes in the US perhaps that will be an easier decision also and there's so much money now it's been so much uh, huge success with the Bitcoin ETF there's so many players now for sure they would love to see you know number two and if they approve ETH then there's going to be 10 if they approve the number two next application then it's like solana cardano will have an etf everyone's gonna have an etf then suddenly and and uh, for good or for bad but that's what's going to happen and uh, there be, must be so many people who smell a business opportunity here like uh, blackrock and i don't know the banks everyone you can't you can't deny what larry fink wants the government can try they can try delay but they can't all right speaking of eth and layer twos there was a very big matic outage that happened uh, over the weekend. Um, does anybody care? Nobody seemed to care. And yeah, <laughs> it, I mean, it goes back to our Polygon L2 they, conversation. Yeah, I mean, with Polygon, they need to uh, turn on the rocket booster because they're falling soon below top 20. And when you fall like below top 20, you're kind of out of people's minds. I mean, you're no no longer, you know, blue chip uh, if you're below top uh, top 20. So it's kind of like IOTA, it was top 10. Uh, also, now it's like top 100, you know, if, if, if even that. And Tezos is another one I just saw today, someone tweeting that, you know, Tezos was top 10, now it is uh, top 90. <laughs> so it's, it's very important if you are below 20. And I remember when Solana was like at 20, but then they turned on, uh, turned on the rocket booster and now they're like top three. So yeah, Polygon really has to do it because if they fall below, they, they may be forgotten more and more. And there's so much attention, so, so much war for people's attention and money that if you're not in the top 20, it's tough. You're muted. Uh, James, you're muted. I was just saying that even Shiba Inu is number 12. And Polygon right. is going to be <laughs> bizarre. Yeah. So uh, there's another thing happening too. And I don't know if you guys have been looking into this. I'm kind of very interested because if we can create Bitcoin as a base layer, but make it usable with kind of a, a high performing layer two on top of it, the sky is the limit because people would have so much more confidence in DeFi if Bitcoin is the base layer. So there are these Bitcoin layer twos supposedly coming. Zeus is one. 
that is basically a it's a play that can do all sorts of things native and cross chain DeFi um, across using again Bitcoin as a base layer with say Solana as the layer two on top. You can be able to trade it, eat ETFs, NFTs, or not ETFs, NFTs, and all sorts of things. Have you guys looked into this one as well, by any chance? Because you know Stacks has been pumping ever since the pre-ETF run. I read a little about it today, but I haven't read about it before. Have you, Ivan? Uh, no, but I mean, uh, I love the overall concept that uh, we, we have Bitcoin and then we can build on top. Uh, I will check more about that. But basically, like you say, James, it is Solana on top of uh, on top of Bitcoin. That sounds exactly. amazing. If they can make it secure, fantastic. Yep. And the other thing that's happening is the founder of Stacks, which is the number one layer two on Bitcoin, is an investor in Zeus. So he's hedging his bets. And I just thought that was very interesting. But I follow the... I saw that too. That was really very interesting, actually. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That, that, that both is definitely... Came. And I tried to understand it, but you kind of look up the BTC and uh, issue this um, you know, wrapped BTC, or what they call it, like said BTC, and uh, then you trade on that on Solana. But... Uh, yeah, they say it's not a bridge. I, I kind of, comp I try, I started reading, but it looks very interesting. I yeah. think the coin isn't released yet, as far as I no. could see. So, guys, don't go and buy another coin with the same name because yes. it doesn't exist yet. There's 20, there's 20 ZSs out there already. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and something like 20,000 uh, meme coins are created a month now. And I think Arbitrum actually is looking to build and invest in a meme coin factory as well, so they can catch up with Solana. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's kind of like Avalanche. Avalanche is investing in the meme coins. They have an official strategy at Avalanche Foundation oh, to wow. buy meme coins. They have criteria which meme coins they buy only on, on Avalanche chain. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's common. Like these foundations, they are pumping memes. It's, it's madness. Now, let's talk a bit about, before we open up to questions, a couple of more things to get through. One. Can you calm the fears? We have a lot of Europeans in the audience. Shout out to everybody in Europe. Um, this came out, uh, basically the EU just banned any transaction above 3,000 euros in crypto. So basically, according to Borovic, it killed DeFi. But we know that technology advances quicker than government regulations, and there's a way of bypassing that. But for you both, knowing Europe very well, what do you think of all this? Is this just... FUD or is it real or what is the government trying to do? Are they concerned? Yeah. Are the central banks concerned? It's a very complex co situation. I mean, the, the way I understand it, that it is not really how the Twitter uh, Twitter influencers have been describing it. It's, uh, it's definitely not a ban. It's not a ban on peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer transactions. You can use self-custody, but it will basically require everyone who is an exchange to KYC your address and to, to basically, if you want to withdraw, for example, from an ex exchange, they will have to know that you own the address. Um, and uh, it's still uh, not implemented fully. It's going to be probably within the coming years. But that, that's my view on it. I, I, that's my understanding of it, uh, that, it's, that it's way of... There is a guy, Patrick Hansen, on Twitter who is... Uh, exactly. I'm sharing exactly that one here. Yeah, yeah share that, Tito, and uh, you can add more uh, color to this. There we are. Exactly. So I think if someone is interested in there, because of course it gets very detailed, this guy is good to follow. He is maybe the only one I think worth following about this topic because there's so much misinformation. Uh, he has been really useful and valuable over the years. And he's saying that it's not like it was described. Uh, it is wrong. It's like Ivan says, it's requirements on exchanges, but it's not banning uh, self-custody wallets or anything like that. So yeah. uh, that, and the details are here. It's like a long thread with a lot of legal details. But that's that's basically the sum of it. And also, it's not in effect, as I understand. So yeah. it it is uh, remains to be seen. He wrote somewhere if they can, uh, you know, if they will um, uh, push it through or not. And my but goal I'm as well. I'm not going to give legal advice here because it's really important. No. So everyone read themselves. <laughs> and my goal is to calm fears within the community here because when people read this if you live in the eu leave now before it turns into north korea and of course everybody's like selling their house packing their bags 
going to El Salvador or somewhere like this. But that doesn't include the <laughs> North Korea part, by the way. <laughs> it, it both can be true. You can still have North Korea direction and that this is not as bad as people thought. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. But I mean, this seems sensible. And I mean, the notion that everyone can sell, send billions to each other completely without KYC and uh, do whatever you want, that's not going to happen in a modern society. It's not. There need to be um, uh, KYC procedures from these big companies so they know who's uh, having the money. It's just the way it's going to be. And uh, But it's not banning the wallets, as was com as was some people said. It, is not correct according to Patrick Hansen. Good stuff. Let's go. We've got two more items. One is very important. This is a political suicide uh, from one of the US presidential candidates. Basically, cryptocurrency is the best hedge against inflation. And many people are saying now what I said last year was if you do not embrace crypto and you are a political candidate, you're basically committing suicide because depending on the country, it could be 30% to 40% of the people have crypto in some form or another. And it's a basic right to be able to spend your money on what you think. Uh, what do you think of this, uh, you guys? Ivan, I see you nodding uh, about, I know yeah. you followed the you followed the American politicians probably more than yeah, I yeah, do. Yeah. I mean, everyone follows because it, it affects everything. And yeah. Uh, yeah, the rate cuts, pro-business against, I mean, whatever happens in the US with the stonks, it affects everyone, especially in crypto. But in terms of this, like uh, politicians, I, in my head, cannot imagine why would you be against crypto? Because let's say you have a, a certain group you want to attract that will vote for you. If they're not in crypto, they don't care about crypto. So if you are pro crypto, they don't even know it and they will still vote for you because of the other issues, taxes, social issues, whatever you have uh, in your program. So the only reason you would be anti crypto is in case you have some kind of donor or something, some kind of interest funding you, which is anti crypto. Yeah. Because there, why else? You, you can be pro crypto. You will not lose any voter because voters don't care about crypto. Even those that are thinking that Bitcoin is a bit suspicious, that's the last thing they care about. They don't even won't even read that you are pro crypto. So uh, that's why it's fully correct. And uh, probably there is some ulterior, how do you say, ulterior motives there and, uh, and uh, uh, reasons why they are against uh, crypto. It's not because of the voters. Good. Yeah, well, also, you have to bear in mind that governments are all about control. They're all about money. And this dovetails into this. So, CTO, there's a very interesting situation happening right now. We know the central banks in the world are united. They talk to each other. They have been printing money on a scale like we have never, ever seen before since COVID. The amount of money printing happening just last week was actually higher than COVID levels. It's hard to believe there's no crisis and the banks are printing and incurring debt like there's no tomorrow. Now, why do we care? Because when there is a lot of debt issued, a lot of money printing, etc., it raises all assets up. So it's very good for Bitcoin. That's probably why the world has realized, uh oh, the government actually has been cra crazy printing for the last whatever. And it's just the central banks all over. It's the ECB, it's the Bank of England, it's the Bank of Japan, it's the Fed, etc. But we, uh, in one day yesterday, last week, the Fed printed 1.2 trillion. The debt servicing will cost 2 trillion very soon. Just interest on debt, which is three times the military budget of the United States. What do you think of this crazy death spiral we are in, CTO? Yeah, I can I share this one because I thought it was so funny. So <clears throat> it was you who sent, <laughs> sent the tweet, uh, Ivan. It's like the Federal Reserve is signaling a willingness to cut rates to head off a job cutting spiral, even if that means some higher inflation for a while. And then the comment, the first comment is, oh, my God, no way. Right before the election, didn't see that one coming. I think yeah. that kind of thumbs it up. We yeah. are moving towards election in the US and in great many other countries. For some reason, there's a lot of countries that have election 2024. And yeah. what are they going to do? They're going to spend money. So everything feels better short term to maximize the chances of winning the election. And I think that will 
go ahead of any like national economic uh, number or policy now short term for the next half year or so. I think I think this guy is summing it up. Yeah, this is it. And they've been doing stealth QE anyway since the banking crisis over a year ago with the BTFP program. That's basically yeah. stealth QE. Ivan, what do you think about this craziness of money printing and debt? And are you happy you own maybe a little bit of Bitcoin? Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, they are, they have a budget now of $1.2 trillion. I read that that budget... You know, it's not for a year. It's until October. <laughs> I mean, you think at least, you know, 1.2 trillion, maybe it's enough for a year. Yeah. It's until October. Yeah. It's crazy. And uh, the, yeah, they have to cut rates very fast. The interest rate uh, service uh, is growing very fast. So I don't know how this will end, but Bitcoin will benefit 100%. So for us, actually, this is good news because, I mean, it, it's the, the plan is unfolding. The plan is uh, going exactly as we've been predicting. And cryptos is the way to protect yourself. It's, it's interesting. Gabor said about the 1.2 trillion, it was a thousand pages. It was issued at 2 a.m. when all the lawmakers are sleeping, and it was approved when they got to the office. No human read this thousand page bill. No human read it. And it's full of what they call pork, and people just stick in whatever they want so they can spend on whoever gives them the most brown envelope cash. And that is what people need to know about how government runs. It is really really <laughs> it's they used yeah. to do it before in more of a covert way now it's just yeah. hey let's just print and let's just lie and everything is fine who cares i, I don't know if you've seen this uh, cto larson on linkedin but there is a guy in sweden now that is exposing corruption like never before because he's oh. built an ai model and he's uh, ordered all of the invoices from all of the municipalities in sweden because you can order that and it's like you know it's like millions of invoices going back decades and he just threw all of it into his ai model and he exposes corruption like never before all of this like subsidies going to the people who decide on the subsidy it's they are the ones running the company that is getting the subsidy they i mean uh, looking at different problems where there is no follow through the municipality just gets an invoice it says like yeah services and they pay hundreds of thousands of dollars per month uh, the question is how much corruption is in that 1.2 trillion and it's like javier Millet has said uh, just recently i think it was a few days ago that the most dangerous situation is when you have people spending other people's money for other people's needs like out of all the situation for example you spend your own money on yourself you're very careful you spend your own money on someone else uh, like buying a gift maybe you're a bit conservative there as well if you have other people spending other people's money on other people's needs that's the most dangerous because that's when like you don't know even if they need it you don't even know the effects of it and so when you see this big budget 1.2 trillion man the the potential for corruption there in 1.2 trillion with the t it's such a big number it's crazy most people cannot even hit, no. fit it in their brain no. or imagine it it's massive it's massive so but it's Absolutely. good for bitcoin at the end of the day it's good for bitcoin and crypto yeah i think it's a double whammy good for bitcoin so now they're gonna spend money here up to the election trillions out with it spend it on miscellaneous stuff it's going they're going to pump the markets and they're going to pump everyone's feeling things, things are getting better they're going to spend more which pumps the market more at the same time so that's one of the whopper burgers and then the other piece of meat is that there will actually be people who feel like just like what you said but wait a minute now are we actually spending trillions of dollars with basically no control no one even read the paper before you know they came to whatever it is uh, this spiraling out of control debt is going to worry people and that mm -hmm. will also benefit uh, bitcoin because on one hand bitcoin moves with, with speculative markets if all the markets go up bitcoin is going to go up also and yeah. also bitcoin goes up the more worried people get about the you know uh, scary scary situation that perhaps we're spiraling the debt out of control and what is actually happening here i'm not a i'm not a macroeconomist but i feel worried i feel there are a lot of people who are actually starting to worry that are we selling out the future here for short-term gains is that oh, what we're doing it's, all, it's, all, it's already happening but the problem is again in simple terms they are printing incredible amounts of money and there's not even a crisis 
Can you imagine when a crisis hits, like a recession or a C-19 or a financial crisis or whatever? And there is a financial crisis coming with global commercial real estate and stuff. I don't know yeah. what the situation is in Sweden. All right, so enough of that. The can point we, is can that... I add one more thing yeah. that I think is so important on, on what Ivan said about... The, I actually read that article also. It's fascinating about the guy putting this in the AI model, trying to create transparency because... In Sweden, we do actually have a lot of transparency. He can he can get the invoices and all that stuff. So he has like millions of invoices to put in. In most countries, you can't even do that. So the current system is very opaque. Is that the word? It's very difficult to see through. Yep. And Larry Fink really explained it so well. Like, what is the ban- benefit of tokenization for the for the stock market? He's talking about assets, right? He's talking about uh, stocks and stuff like that how much easier compliance will get because it's completely transparent suddenly who owns the share can make sure on chain that there is no you know hanky panky going on here and there <laughs> and so so he understand the the benefit of the on chain transparency and the same is true in this situation, same that this say that this would have been fully transparent. Maybe all the government spending should be transparent. It should be tokenized, and it should be transparent, so everyone can go into the public ledger and see was this correctly done or not. And that's the kind of transparency that blockchain and crypto brings, which I, I think many politicians haven't understood. Like we had another politician a couple of days ago in Iceland that. Uh, went out and said that Bitcoin is like the enemy of the people and whatever, something like that. And she hadn't really understood that there are these kind of transparency advantages that I think actually she would have liked if she had taken the time to to understood it. But for some reason, I went and checked her uh, background. She she is um, uh, she was du- deputy chairperson of the left green movement and so on. For some reason, it's usually left politicians who kind of get in this knee-jerk uh, opinion for some reason. I don't know why that is, but it's uh, just another reflection. It is. It's very unusual, particularly in the left. Uh, in the US, the left is very anti-crypto. Okay, let's do our final topic real quick. I want to help the audience here with something that I was inspired by Ivan this morning. He was busy all day planning for the week so he could slay the week. So. Oh, so what, what I try and do at the beginning of the week is I set my game plan, you know, what I want to achieve for the week, have the goals, you know, plan out every single day. I've got a very regimented schedule, seven days a week. It doesn't change. Block out time for certain things. You know, it's tax season in the U.S., so I need to block out certain time for that. So a couple of hours this afternoon and stuff. And of course, have a positive mindset. They're kind of my big five. Ivan, what would, what is your big five? tips to slay the week for you for the audience here how do you organize your busy life yeah i mean that's very important i mean for me the most important thing on monday is is to get the all the teams working in the same direction as we're working with our apis at morales with our b2c app morales money and there is a lot of overlap between the different tech we build for the b2b and b2c side so on mondays that's where most of my time is but also on a personal level uh, on, on more of a personal level i do it on sunday to really think through the week think through the most important uh, three things that the week needs to achieve on a big uh, big level because at the end of the day it is the saying that i heard in school which is very good to fail to plan is to plan to fail (laughs) okay very important but it it is like that you have a bit of clarity you know exactly what uh, what the focus is and um and yeah and also you know approximately how much each week you can achieve and you can track it most importantly if you can have three big things each week that really move the needle in your life and you can follow through is fantastic if you don't you feel that you're uh, active you feel you feel that you're productive but uh, you you don't actually know if you are probably not if you don't track it so you got a couple of mine like your tasks and then your goals and then your routine which is exactly which is good too. exactly yeah. so i mean three big things can be for example that uh, i want to learn something i mean normally you know try a new chain or try some technology so i my, myself have good hands-on another goal can be that we at morales as a team we move past some challenge and we can ship something and uh, it can also be on a, a health level to work out spend uh, spend time on yourself which is very easy to forget in a bull market um and that i, li- I like the time blocking what you have as well on the on the screen because 
because sometimes some people get into this uh, problem where they have calls throughout the day. Like you have 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there. It's better to time block. So you have, let's say, all calls only on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and only in the morning. So you can then use your brain for more creative things, and you're not always cluttered. So that's a good one. Morning routine, that one I actually don't have too, too, too extensive one, um, but uh, we're curious to hear about your morning routine, the CTO and, uh, uh, and James. Uh, what do you do? I ice cold, bath, coffee. Uh, <laughs> what do you guys do? I go up at 3 a.m., bathe in ice cold coffee, and then... <laughs> <laughs> No, I, 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 it is it is a very important topic actually because you can almost have someone show you their uh, routines and you can almost tell their results based on that. So as you say, a lot of people get um, in a reactive mode. They are like cluttered, as you say. There's incoming stimulation from all kinds of, uh, typically from this kind of thing. And they're always reacting and can't really get any own speed forward. And it's very important to get out of that mindset. You have to get in control of yourself and your, your time. So, I mean, time blocking is maybe one of the easiest way to do it. You book time in your calendar yourself. If you have to schedule it or it's not going to get done and you have to, you know, allocate time. That is, that is absolutely true where you're not in a reactive mode. And another thing is, you also touched on that, Ivan, you have to kind of invest in yourself. You have to invest in your own learning and your own growth, or you will not get anywhere. And it has never been so easy to do that as in crypto. You don't need to ask anyone to go study. There is no barrier to education here, as there, there actually was. I mean, you could argue that you could always go to the library and read to become a doctor or something but it wasn't in practice that you you uh, if we even if you ignore the license part of it i think you couldn't practically do it you had to go into harvard medical school or something like that but with crypto it's different there is no harvard crypto school where james and ivan are standing as the lecturers and if you can't get into the room you will not learn from those people everything is accessible here you just have to take the time to actually study and not only like not only study on the surface like okay Ivan tell me which coin should I buy and then oh no it's down today Bitcoin is down you told me it's going to go up yesterday today it's down two percent everything is lost no I'm not talking about that kind of learning you have to learn deep you have to learn how stuff works you have to you know sit and study and everything is available in a way that it has never been before not with and i think it's still not with any other topic than crypto even ai or something i think it's hard to get to the cutting edge of ai unless you work with those people those other people but in crypto you can you can get to the cutting edge of this technology yourself yes. in front of the computer and that is wonderful i love that and it's fun. I try to learn every day, try to figure out who to learn from, try to read a lot and uh, try to get a little bit better every day. And learnings compound. We always talk about that the capital compounds. Everyone understand if you like grow 10% many times, it compounds. But it's like that with learning also. If you can build upon past learnings, it compounds in the exact same way. And then you can translate that into money in so many ways. You can get the job to further compound on that. And the more you know, the better job you can get in the industry. And then you can maybe use those learnings to understand which protocols might make it. And you maybe invest in those and, you know, grow like that. That is, uh, yeah, that's how I try to operate. And uh, yeah, I try to have consecutive time that you can sit and really work on one thing for many hours. Don't don't block time 30 minutes in a go. No, you need a whole afternoon maybe to sit and research something. Awesome. That's all right. <laughs> well, this, this is brilliant, guys, and I like that. We've got about 10 minutes left. We'll make it fast. We've got some cool questions from the audience. Are you guys ready? Ready Let's for do questions. It. Okay. First of all, B-Man63. Love the research community and KPMs every day from you all. Thank you so much, B-Man. And call me Josh. Big shout out to Ivan, who introduced me to James and CTO. 
uh, who together have helped me mold and shape me into a razor sharp trading tool in crypto. You all have been crucial in the cycle. My performance is up more than 1000% from the previous cycle. Thank you. So that's uh, from Call Me Josh. A big thank you to you both. And a thank you to Ivan for that too. Um, this next question is from Siricorn Chatpathanam. Hope I got that right. Is Cadena still got potential in this bull run? Well, you're asking the two best people for Cadena. <laughs> CTO, over to you. I think I was tough on it already the time when it actually was pumping. Uh, it was well, yeah, one of those examples where I actually tried using it because it was all over social media. Everyone said how great it was. And then I made the effort to actually test it myself and it kind of didn't work. And then I went into the documentation and realized that no one had actually read it because it went to a lot of uh, 404 links, uh, you know, page not found and so on. So that shows a little bit of the power of uh, own studies to actually try things. Yep. I think you mentioned it, was it yesterday or today even also that you tried to, you know, test own chains and uh, yeah try to get your hands yeah. dirty learn about how it actually works and i and often I find remember that those, lot CTO, though those were amazing you should do more of them like trying different things evaluating uh, project um, uh, but uh, this one i haven't used uh, myself yeah. so uh, don't know and and a week a week before you did your video cto you know we were in touch i did mine because i noticed as well i always say this it's real simple if something is pumped hard it's a scam, okay? If you have, say, a critical mass of two or three channels pumping the same thing, it's probably a scam. Uh, and that's a simple metric. Second of all, I looked at all the fundamentals behind Cadena. It was complete trash. We have a thing called a compendium score. It was just a disaster zone. And uh, then it's so funny because, well, I, will, I won't say what happened, but sometimes I'm on the receiving end of things and I saw something that just took me aback. So it's not going to fly. Um, everybody, hope is not a strategy in the crypto space. Be with the winners. And the most important thing too, as CTO said, I call it dog fooding. Learn to eat your own dog food. If you don't taste something, if you don't use it, if you don't experience it, then you don't know how bad it is. But once you once you use a platform, uh, it's like, like Warren Buffett drinks Coca-Cola. Although it's poison, he likes it. <laughs> Therefore, he understands it. He buys insurance. He understands it. So make sure you understand whatever you invest in. If you don't, you're just throwing your money away. Okay, Master of Coin. Question for discussion that Ivan brought up this morning. Base versus Solanzo, or is it Solana? Um, is it Solanzo? Yeah, I mean, according to Jim Cramer, uh, he said, uh, <laughs> I think in one of the videos, Solanzo and Cardanzo, uh, but yeah, I mean, we've noticed that uh, base, at least uh, today on Dex Screener, is higher volume than uh, Solana, but not higher in number of transactions. So <clears throat> potentially we do see this, that everyone is just using one L2 that has an on-ramp from Coinbase. And then we don't have this problem with the bridge and uh, all of that. Uh, so let's see if this trend sustains, but it seems that the market now uh, is hyping up memes on the base because we've had now on Solana for months and months and now on base, it's a bit uh, spicy. It's a bit, it's something new to be excited about. So let's see how that, if that sustains or not, but have you been looking at that uh, James today with the volumes? Yeah. Uh, and we've got all the real-time feeds. And remember, a lot of people get confused about base. They get all excited. Oh, I want to buy base. You can't buy it. There is no token. It's a centralized, yeah, no token. It's centralized layer two for Coinbase to help them scale, and become more effective and efficient. That's it. So don't get don't get excited about that. Plus, you know my stance on layer twos anyway. So we don't know. We don't have to drill into that. That's cool. Chef Guevara, what does winning look like for crypto? I want to know if legacy politics and media are losing and how we prove we are winning. That's a very interesting question. And Chef is in Deutschland, if I recall correctly. CTO, over to you. How do we know that crypto is winning versus traditional politics and regulation and media? I mean, th that was what I feel will dominate my thinking for over the next couple of decades is really this era digitalis. I think the change that is coming is bigger than anyone can imagine. Yes. 
and it will fundamentally change the world in ways that's kind of hard to overlook. I think one thing is that it will, we're already seeing it, right? The world is becoming more global. 20 years ago, it was different. It was more local. Today, you know, teenagers all over the world, doesn't matter where they live. They do more or less the same things on the same platforms. Of course, there's a little bit of gated access to, to things in China. So they have their own copy, but it's basically the same thing. Uh, otherwise, it's the same. And then what will happen then is that the leaders of those big in, uh, companies or protocols will get more power. People like Elon Musk or, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or uh, Google CEO or someone, they're going to get more power because it doesn't really matter which country you live in exactly, you still have to use the same Google service or the, you know, the same X or something like that. And the same will be true for crypto. And I think many politicians kind of feel this. They can't quite put the fingers on it, but the control is like pouring a sand between the fingers. And uh, of course, that is maybe stronger in smaller countries. In the US, you still feel like, OK, but we decide what's going to happen in the world. Uh, no one's going to go after us. And also many of the companies are US based companies. So they feel that they have more control. But I think that technology will continue eating into that. And that will have fundamental changes. Suddenly, no one cares about what, uh, you know, the some politician says in some small country about their monetary policy, they don't have control over it anymore. It's the market and it's more and more technology that will steer that. And I think it, it will not be an event. It will not be like on this day, uh, crypto one or something like that, but it will be digital money on the internet that will become more and more, uh, important that no one really has control over we're already in that stage no one can really control it anymore it just sits there it's just like i don't know gold or something and yeah. i think that that's what's going to happen it's going to be less and less control for if, if the person asking the question in germany for like the bundeskanzler or the finance minister they will uh, you know lose control to technology and that mm. trend will continue until but, they don't have much control anymore. That will be yeah. the winning um, moment. And, and what happens is as they start to lose control, they get more desperate, more and more yes. desperate. But people will vote with their money and their decisions and what they adopt. Uh, it's like when things, when regimes get really out of control, people vote with their feet. They leave. And now it's become easier and easier to have options to move around the planet as you need as going forward. So that's a very interesting question, Chef. Thank you for all the great work you do. Uh, Andrew Hoxie, is it possible that these ETFs such as BlackRock and he said Vanguard, but Vanguard don't have an ETF. They don't actually don't even like Bitcoin. Uh, don't actually hold one to one Bitcoin for what they are saying. Have you guys dug into that? Obviously, there was very strict audit requirements for the ETFs yeah. to prove they have these reserves. Ivan? Yeah, I, I think people are looking into it. And there are lists of wallets that BlackRock um, is uh, is having their Bitcoin in. I think Dan Nansen has done uh, such a report, maybe even Arkham. But th these analysis companies uh, are tracking it. So it seems that uh, there is there is a known list. And the way Coinbase custody works is that it's not in one wallet. So it, it's uh, it's not that you see just one single address and uh, you can follow it. They do have uh, many different ones. Uh, but as far as I know, there are people tracking it for sure. Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. The final question is regarding, let me pull this up, from Yoga Cat. James, would you do a video Avalanche versus Sol? I switched my ETH and link bags to Sol. I was thinking about switching Avalanche too. I've actually done that <laughs> a couple of times. And I, what, what do you guys first of all think of Avalanche versus Sol yourselves? I don't feel that Avalanche has the momentum now. I think it's Solana and Base that has the momentum. That's my take. I saw this one. Uh, can I share yeah. this tab? The Coin Gecko report or the 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 debridge. The flows. Yeah. You always have a good uh, take on this, James. If exactly. I can share this. I mean, right there. All the money's flowing. So here's the flows from and to. So everything appears on both sides, like Solana out, Solana in, Ethereum 
you know, out Ethereum in. But there's a lot of flows to base uh, right now from both Ethereum and Solana. That that I think is a fact. And yeah. uh, the question is where it will go. I personally think that it's a it's a huge disadvantage that base has that they don't have a token because there is no way then to really um, there's no easy way or straightforward way to take part in the success of the ecosystem as such, while there is for all other ones on the left, almost. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's Coinbase stock that uh, that is probably the the way, but also they will likely do a coin uh, in the future. Um, I think it's uh, it's quite likely, and that's going to be interesting because then we have a U.S. publicly listed company with an L2 with a coin. That's going to be very interesting if they can pull that off. But in in terms of Avalanche, things do pump on top of Avalanche. But it's a good point that you that you uh, made the CTO that there is not capital flowing in there, but memes on Avalanche are quite hot like when you look at uh, uh, the performance of the different ones and that people are excited about but maybe it's because avalanche foundation is buying them which is in their <laughs> which is in their uh, foundation strategy to buy meme coins uh, but overall it's one of this you know it's solana which is doing very well in terms of like what people are excited about and then i do hear a lot of buzz from avalanche as well uh, but uh, yeah, looking at the inflows doesn't seem to be that uh, that big, and all of it is in the C chain. There is still limited adoption of this subness that they have. So yeah, let's let's uh, keep an eye on that. But uh, inflows is uh, the way to look at it. Check check. You're muted. Uh, this is uh, the consensus trade that I said over a year ago. Uh, from CoinGecko, they had a survey that the blockchain that has the most interest, we have many surveys, the blockchain that's used the most from Milk Road, etc. But most importantly, is kind of like a little face-off here. If you can see, you can look at Avalanche versus Solana. There is no area in which Avalanche beats Solana. And all the metrics from TVL to users to speed to block time to... Stablecoin, market cap, DEX, volume, it's just, it's no game. But but the interesting thing, though, however, regarding how Avalanche is running, from what I understand, they do, ha they are like the gaming chain, is that correct? They're trying to position themselves as the gaming chain? Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's how they position themselves. There yeah. is nothing like technically that is, uh, that is putting them as such, but from a marketing perspective and that there are more and more games lately. So they have attached themselves quite nicely to this gaming trend for sure. Yeah. And that's one place that I, I've, it's not my wheelhouse. So um, Yoga Cat, I have done a video on that. Uh, very clearly, I don't hold, I, I tend to go after the winner and just buy that. So. I don't hold any other layer ones except a 0.6% allocation to Ethereum, just in case it explodes, <laughs> which it's not going to. Uh, I think the smaller horses will run faster. That's basically it. Um, any final thoughts? I want to say a quick thank you to Jeff Hammer, Tesla Bull Believer, Blazo, Joseph Samuel, Bitcoin Maxi Mike, The Great Escape, and Piper. We've got 5,000 people watching live. Thank you all for coming. Don't forget as well to subscribe to these channels, these gurus out there and of course next week if i'm not mistaken ivan run your show yep yep okay, next, next week my show next oh, monday 69,500 69,488 yeah and by the way regarding bitcoin it's very interesting because i look at the buy and sell walls there's not much selling between here and 75,000 i just checked so literally if a big buyer comes in tonight we could go straight to 75k we'll Hmm? Sorry, and once Bitcoin, one, uh, yeah, we're gonna snap. And once Bitcoin yeah. really leaves the previous all-time high, it normally does excess. It's not you know yes. plus thirty percent. Is it does excess? So that's why maybe next week we are at ninety k on my channel. Yeah. <laughs> it's not impossible. I mean, if we really break seventy five, it's gonna be price discovery. It may be ninety k. Just look at what happened once we broke twenty k in twenty twenty in like November. Very fast, like. A week, two weeks, it was already 35. So if we break 75, if can we go to 80, 90? Very possible, very possible. Yeah, there's also another interesting angle too, because I look at the option action. If we go to 73, 74K, there is going to be a massive short squeeze, which will propel us beyond 75K. So not only do we have no sell wall, 
but we also have a ton of shorts that are going to get completely wrecked, <laughs> which they've got to, you know, chase the Bitcoin price action to cover. So if we do get that pump above 72, 73, we go straight to 75. It's that simple. Then at 75, there's some selling, but if we can break that sell wall, it's clear up ahead beyond that. 88K seems to be the target for the next 30 days, in my opinion, which is very close, by the way, CTO, to your 89K line earlier. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, yeah. what could happen now also in media is that if you go back to all time high, the halving is coming. There will be a lot of coverage of that. Yeah. No matter, I mean, despite what we said about mainstream media before, they will probably write about this that there's, <laughs> you know, all time high and there's halving coming. And then uh, there will be more people discovering that, oh, Bitcoin isn't dead. I thought it died in 2017 yeah. or something. And, and a big thank you as well for Ivan for the bearfluencers and the pamping. <laughs> Where do you get these words? Where do you make these words up from? Uh, I don't know, man. It's my brain. It's uh, yeah. coming. That's the best thing with English as second language. You don't see any restrictions. That you don't yeah. see any restrictions. You mix and match, mash together, and uh, that's the that's uh, that's how that works. <laughs> that's excellent. <laughs> Well, that was Slay the Week, everybody. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, gentlemen. Next week on Ivan's channel, don't forget to subscribe to both CTO and Ivan. Love you guys. Love everybody Thanks, here in the guys. audience. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. And enjoy the delicious markets. 69.6. Oh, yeah. Not bad. Thanks, everybody. Have a great, Thanks, great guys. week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye.